What is going on, Trash Talkers? We are back with another episode for you. Today, we start off by reacting to and breaking down Anderson Silva's final fight as a UFC professional fighter as he faced off against Uriah Hall in UFC 12's Fight Night main event. Plus, we recap Greg Hardy's yet another dominant performance and debate whether he is ready to face a ranked opponent for his next fight. Next, we take a look at the lightweight division in the UFC and discuss what we think Dana White will do when it comes to crowning a new champion. Finally, we move over to the NFL where we break down all of the trades made as we surpass the trade deadline and predict the key matchups as we head into week nine. All that and much more coming your way right now. Nick, it was a very quiet week in sports, which is a little odd for us, uh, you know, after coming off of weeks with the MLB playoffs and NBA finals and just consistent storyline after storyline. Uh, Khabib in the UFC. I mean, you know, we saw how much traction that got. Uh, this was a, a welcomed quiet week for sports in general, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it really was. And I mean, this is, I guess, what we can expect for a little while. I mean, there's no basketball, no baseball. We're, we're really left with the UFC, which is going on every week, and, and, and the NFL. Uh, I mean, hopefully COVID doesn't get rid of that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, I'll take what I can get. I can't complain. Things are looking good. And, you know, we, we've had a, a couple big days. At least today's a big day for not only the nation, but for the NFL. Uh, big trade day. Uh, it was it was interesting, and uh, we'll, we'll have to get into it as we, as we go through it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, the NFL trade deadline is, usually has a lot of movement either leading up to it, but, uh, you know, lead, you know, right at the deadline, it seems to get quiet. This was a little different. It was pretty quiet, maybe a couple moves in the week, uh, in the week leading up to the deadline. And then, you know, all day on Tuesday, there was nothing. It well, just nothing happened. Yeah, and that that's usually how it goes. You never see any major trades on the day of the deadline. It's usually the the week prior. And so, honestly, this was expected, especially with the way the, the league is working, the season is going for a lot of teams. This kind of felt like it was going to be a dud. I didn't expect much from this. I didn't have high hopes for this trade deadline. And so uh, it, it, it kind of worked out the way I expected it to. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, I want to talk a lot about the UFC today, um, just because there was there was so much that happened, so much that went on, that I feel like we should spend a considerable amount of time with it. Um, first off, we, we want to talk about uh, one of the fights on UFC 12's fight night uh, main card, uh, Greg Hardy, uh, former NFL defensive player for the Cowboys um, and Carolina Panthers. He, he had some his struggles early on in his UFC career. Uh, you know, I, I can remember watching him early and he used his inhaler uh, in between rounds. And, you know, that cost him the fight because you can't do that in the, in the UFC. <laughs> what do you mean? I can do that in the NFL. Why can't I do it in the UFC? Uh, you know, some things you just have to learn the hard way. Greg Hardy definitely learned that one the hard way. Um, so Greg Hardy defeated Maurice Green to become 8-2-0 and with one no contest, that no contest being the inhaler, I believe. Right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it was. And then he had the disqualification, which, which was one of his losses. That was his first UFC fight. That was fight. his first ever UFC fight. Yeah, yeah, and that was just him. And and it's still him not knowing the rules. He, he still He's not only new to the UFC, he's new to the sport. And... I think with Greg Hardy, we're definitely seeing some major improvements in his game. And I think that Greg Hardy is getting to the point where he's got to be considered 
one of the top 15 best heavyweights, or if he's not, if you don't want to put him there, give him a, a top 15 opponent and make him prove himself. I know he's faced Alexander Volkov. That's his other loss along with the DQ. And that came in a unanimous decision. He went all three rounds. He stood in there with Volkov. And Volkov has been has been lighting it up lately. I think it's time for him to get another shot at a ranked opponent to prove himself. This is a guy that continues to improve and get better. And I think that he really needs to be taken seriously now. I, he's, he's a big draw, especially for people who are casual fans who don't really know MMA or UFC and, and, and just see the name Greg Hardy and they're, they're intrigued. This is a guy who could really bring people into the sport, and I think that the UFC needs to start taking more advantage of that and, and start giving him better opponents that are going to lead to better fights. Yeah, for sure. Um you know that there was there's a lot of storylines with Greg Hardy and a lot uh, of negative storylines at that too. So I think Dana White has to has to balance that. One well, of which, uh, well, one, let's one get of to which, it. let's get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of which uh, happened kind of under the radar and didn't get a lot of traction. Now we feel like it's definitely noteworthy. We want to talk about it. Um, so this fight between Greg Hardy and Maurice Green was almost called off about two hours beforehand because, uh, quote unquote, people from his past tried to extort Hardy for $800,000. Now, the people from his past are tied to uh, the charges of domestic violence that he was accused of in 2014. Uh, the charges were eventually dropped. So we don't exactly know the extent in which the uh uh extortion or whatever the case is was was trying to take place what they were trying to do if they said that you know they they were gonna bring up t to light more evidence or if somebody else was gonna claim something or what we don't know exactly those details nonetheless this this did happen and i feel like this needs to be talked about because with the ufc with dana white they have to understand who they have in a fighter in greg hardy no, they absolutely do, and this is something, I don't know how much the UFC can really help him out, because this is a personal matter. He's got to uh, either reach out for help, or he's got to deal with it on his own, and with this situation, this is this is an incident that happened back in 2014, six years ago at this point, and he's having people now come after him to because he's he's in the limelight. He, he's co-maining events, he's uh, a big name in a, in a new sport. He's he's a big name. People still recognize that name in, in the NFL. So they're trying to take advantage of him and, and take whatever money he has left over. And if we go back to the incident, I'm not going to harp on this too much, but if you read into it and you see the, the real details on it and get the court documents of what occurred, it is appalling that this man was dragged through the mud. Everything that was said about him and that was against him was completely false. No, he has he is was an innocent man, and I and I agree with him. Everything he said in that post fight uh, co press conference was accurate. I went back, I went through all of the court documents, and I, I read through all of the the statements. What what happened was, was just him being screwed over by the system. Is this is just you know oh, oh, just people taking advantage of him and and it not only cost him his NFL career it not only cost him millions of dollars but it now it's affecting a new sport that he's fallen in love with a sport that he is thriving in and it's costing him opportunities here and this is something that needs to be taken care of and he needs to take care of it not only himself but if he needs help reach out for it because there are plenty of people out there that are going to be willing to help him in this situation. He, there, there's, sure. there's no reason that somebody should be reaching out to him two hours before a fight starts and trying to extort him for some money. Like that, that, that's just unbelievable that, that this is still happening. I, I just don't understand where people, where, where people are coming from, where they think they get off thinking they can find a, a, get a quick buck by saying, oh, I have some details on you. If you don't want them to get out, pay me this money. There's no explanation for the less decency side of humanity. I mean, the fact remains that people do this all the time. You know, people people have no morals. They have no values. Uh, when, with that being said, though, you know, it, it's tough to try to ride, you know, from, from a brand perspective, from the UFC's perspective. 
this guy has a checkered past, whether because the, the average fan, the average person who watches the UFC is not going to take the time that you took to go into the court documents, to go into everything and and look into his past. All they know is that he was shunned from the NFL for domestic violence charges. And whether they prove to be innocent or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, he ended up here in the UFC. He's been fighting really well. Um, and if his past continues to haunt him, I can't imagine that the UFC isn't taking note of that and saying, listen, we know it's not your fault, but we don't want our brand associated with these sorts of things. Either get your past under control. That's not going to happen. That, that, but that's, that's not going to happen because... We you don't look know at, look, that's look, not going to happen. Look at John Jones. I mean, let's 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 just take one guy in, into this. John Jones has done a litany of things throughout his career, and right, but John the Jones UFC is arguably one him. of the greatest fighters of this all is time. One, this is one of the things I love about Dana White. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you bring in money. If you make him money, he doesn't care. He'll stick up for you. He'll fight for you. He'll do what it takes to to get you there on fight night. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, what you've done in your past. And, and that's what's so great about this sport. It does like you get a second opportunity in the UFC. And I think that's why Greg Hardy is so grateful for where he is and, and not upset about not being uh, not getting bigger opponents and not uh, being getting paid more. I mean, this is a guy who went from the heights of being a Pro Bowl player in the NFL to then working at an LA Fitness because he needed money to make ends meet. Like, that, that is unbelievable. To then pick himself up, go into the UFC, and I don't want to say dominate, but he has truly been impressive for a guy that two years ago just started fighting. He, he, he walked into uh, a gym and started getting trained and has come this far. Like, it, it, there's a lot of athletes out there, but not most of them can't fight. And this is a guy who, who can fight. And it, yeah. I think through, through more training, give him time to get more experience, you know, I, think, I think he will be able to be somebody in the heavyweight division. Now, I think that raises another question issue with Greg Hardy is his mismanagement of weight cuts. This is a guy who almost missed weight uh, leading up to this fight. He had to get uh, uh, approval from the Nevada State Athletic Commission to uh, work off some of the weight so he could make weight at the heavyweight uh, in the heavyweight class. Uh, he, I, he, he was playing at 290 pounds in the NFL, and that's what he still walks around at. And as much as he says... You know, each weight cut is better than the next. He's missing weight. It can't be that easy for him. He's not taking, he's either not taking it seriously enough or it's too hard. You know, he, he's, that's something he's truly got to work on. And that's going to impede him moving forward when it comes to stamina. You know, if he, if he gets a tougher opponent and he will, it's going to be much harder for him to stand in there for 15 to 25 minutes and, and be a, a solid, solid fighter. Right. So, I mean, you, you've you talked a lot about him getting, uh, you know, better fights or more uh, competent fighters and possibly going into the ranks of the, the heavyweight uh, class. Do you think it's time that Greg Hardy receives a, a bout with a ranked opponent? And if so, what, like how far, how, how high does that rank go? Does it go well, no, to 10? He, yeah, that's exactly where it is. He, he, he's not going to get anything better than that. Alexander Volkov was the exception. He was a guy that's still on the rise, you know, and, and making his way up in the heavyweight class, in the uh, heavyweight ranks. But I think that, uh, that that was kind of reaching. I think Dana was reaching in that instance and thought Greg Hardy would be able to handle himself. And, hey, he stuck in there for 15 minutes and went to decision, and he lost unanimously. But right. Greg Hardy is getting better every time he fights. He's not going to fight now for another you know, three, four months, and he'll be better the next time we see him. But I think he's, he's in his mid-30s. He's not getting any younger. If you want, if you're going to give him an opportunity to be something in this league and not just a journeyman, you've got to give him a ranked opponent now, and, and it's got to be somebody between top ten and top fifteen. 
it's somebody in that range. And there's plenty of good guys that that would be up for the challenge. I think that would that would really uh, give him a good fight. I think that's so give something... me give me two or three names that you could possibly see Greg Hardy go after because I I, I believe that he has the skill set and the the um, ability to to beat these guys. Uh, I, I just I want to hear you know who you think he best matches up with who who would be a uh, name that you would want to put on a UFC card whether it's you know a, a co-main for a fight night or if it's a, a main card for a pay-per-view yeah I mean I would probably look at number 14 and 15 in the heavyweight division I'll start with Marcin Tybura I, I believe he is the uh, training partner for Jan Blahovitz. Uh, I mean, you guys can correct me on that if I'm if I'm wrong, but Tybura has been pretty solid. He's a young guy. He's moving up. He'll be he'll be great in the heavyweight division. He ha- he has a bright future, and I think this is a great place. I think this is a great fight against Greg Hardy. You know, these guys are going to go at it. They're they're very um, very aggressive strikers, and I think that it'll be a good fight. And I think. One thing that Greg Hardy is missing is he hasn't had somebody who's rung his bell, who's who's really taken it to him. And in order for some fighters to get to that next level in their career, they need to be dropped. They need to be uh they they need to be taken down. And so I think that's something that Greg Hardy Greg Hardy's never been knocked out. He's never he it, it, you know his He's lost to a decision. He he's lost to disqualifications. He's lost to an inhaler, even though you know that that happened afterward. He ended up winning that fight. Right. It you know he has not had somebody who's been able to take him out. And in order for him to improve, I think that he needs to be humbled, and that's through a knockout. So I think Mar- Marcin Tybura is definitely a guy who can do that. And then Blagoy Ivanov. A, a guy I really like, a guy I remember when he he fought uh um uh who is it um I I'm forgetting his name but uh in his in his last fight um he 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 struggled a little bit and I think uh, same thing with Blagoy happened with um with Greg Hardy in that he got an opponent that was too far above his caliber and they were trying to move him up in the UFC way way before he was ready and Blagoy, yeah he has previous um experience fighting in in other promotions and other forms of mma but i think that uh, Blagoy has a lot of potential in the ufc and he would be another great opponent for greg hardy uh i just looked it up Blagoy's last fight was tied to ivasa okay it was tied to ivasa yeah um okay those i mean those are some good names i mean those are those are some interesting names because in my eyes if he can if he can fight one of these guys and he can a last the entire fight and also show that you know he can put up quite the fight even if he doesn't win whether it's by decision or whatever i'd still like to see him move up and continue to uh, progress within that division because again we're talking about a guy who only started fighting two years ago and i mean not for anything but age is not on his side right now i mean he's he's working against the clock so he, you know he's got to start moving faster and faster excuse me um but i think these two fights would definitely provide a lot of uh a lot of context for where Greg Hardy can be. I think these will be uh, definition fights is what I like to call them. They're going to define whether he's going to be somebody that should be uh, featured in this division, or if he's going to be that, uh, that, you know, quote unquote journeyman where he's just going to be the guy that, you know, if you want to move up, you have to go through Greg Hardy and a couple of these other guys. Um, So it'll be interesting to, to see for sure. But, um, yeah, you know, the, do you do you foresee Dana White actually going through with this in the next, uh, I guess, four or five months? Oh, I definitely do. I think Dana White is a smart guy. He knows the value that Greg Hardy brings, and he knows that Greg Hardy 
is is getting progressively better. He's going to go back. He's going to learn from this fight with Maurice Green. And, and he is going to uh, get better. Like, I, I think that you can only expect a guy who's been in a sport for two years, two and a half years, to get better every day that he's in a gym. Like, the, right. you got to think the NFL. Think about when, you know, he was in peewee football and he just learned how to tackle. Well, now he's going to learn to hit harder. Now he's going to learn techniques. He's going to learn swim moves and and pass rush moves and all these things he, once you learn the basics then you can dive into the nitty gritty and you can start to to then learn more he he is a striker he is that and a lot of heavyweights are strikers he's got to work on his ground game he's got to work on on so much that he is going to improve in each one of those areas he's not going to be elite in any of them right. but he's going to improve a lot more than than what he has shown so far yeah, I mean, you know, it, you start with the basics of not using an inhaler and not getting disqualified. <laughs> that, that's where you start. Well, you start by learning the rules of the of the sport. <laughs> right. I, I feel like that that should go without being said, but I feel like at this point we have to say it. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's enough for Greg Hardy, but there was somebody else who fought on the same card, uh, the, the main event for those of you who don't know. Um who doesn't need to di- dive into the to the beginning steps of fighting. He's been doing it for quite some time. That would be Anderson Silva. I'm sure you've heard of him. If, if, if you know anything about the UFC, he is one of the uh, faces, the names of that the UFC was built on. He is a... One of the greatest uh, of all time. <laughs> he, he, yeah, I mean, he is just... The, he's one of the guys that he helps bring up the, the younger generation. He fought against the uh, the, be- the best generation that, that came through. Um, you know, he, he's done it all. He's been through adversity. He's, he's seen it all. Uh, but the headline fight was Uriah Hall and Anderson Silva... Uh, we were set for a five-round crazy match. Uriah Hall uh, a- absolutely uh, looks up to Anderson Silva. He admires him to no end. Um, to, needless to say, I think they are friends a- as well. I mean, I, out, outside of the ring, I think they are friends. Um, Uriah Hall defeats Anderson Silva in the fourth round by TKO. Uh, and then... It was interesting enough for those of you who didn't watch Uriah Hall gets down on his knees and shares about a three to five minute experience with Anderson Silva, where Uriah Hall is in tears, crying his eyes out and apologizing for knocking out Anderson Silva or uh, because that he knew that this was Anderson Silva's last professional fight. Um I mean, just if you can, if you get a chance, go back and watch it. Uh, it was an incredible scene to to witness. Uh, but Nick, I, I just want to get what did you think of everything that transpired after the fight? Not 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 necessarily in the ring, but right after. Yeah, I mean, this is we all knew coming into this. This was his last fight, and even Dana White said afterward that he's lucky he had this fight. You know, this, I mean, at 46 years old, it's a surprise that he even made it to the ring and was able to fight this. And you you see it. This is not the Anderson Silva of old. This isn't, you know, prime Anderson Silva, even in the slightest. This is a guy who's a shell of himself, and he's just a victim to age. You know, you, you're just, you can't, your body gives out after a, a, a certain point. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he he just loves fighting so much. His passion, his his ability to love a sport when he he already knows pretty much everything. He he goes in every day and trains and loves to do do it. Loves to to get down there on the mat and, and just use all of his tools and try to learn new things. It, it's absolutely amazing to see somebody like that who has that that courage and that will to, to really uh, improve when they're already the best at what they do. And to see Anderson Silva do that at 46 years old and as, you know, the, one of the best of all time, it, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, Anderson Silva, 
the, it wasn't a good performance, and you could see that Uriah Hall was struggling fighting him. Uh, it was just it was tough for him as somebody who adored adores him like Uriah Hall does. It, it was very very tough and very emotional for him, and you knew at the end of the third round it looked like it was about to be over, and then in the fourth round that's when Uriah Hall was like, okay. I think let's, I think it's let's time. End this. Let, yeah, yeah. I, I think Anderson Silva was kind of thinking the same thing. One, once the nose was was split open, uh, you know that that's when things kind of got out of control. Sorry. And Anderson Silva, you could tell by his expression. You've we've. It's always been. I mean, Anderson Silva never is definite about anything, and we we've thought for the last few fights that this might be his last one, but I think we knew it in this one. It's not only his last fight in the UFC, we know that for sure, but I think it's his last MMA fight in his career. Just the way he was taking in everything after the fight, the way he was just sitting there, just on the mat, and and, and it, it was a, a true moment that he he was just collecting his thoughts and, and really... Um, just soaking it all soaking in. Soaking it all in, exactly. You know, yeah. that's why it's when you know he he knows that it's that it's his time and and I think he was coming to terms with it. So, yeah, I mean so I mean Silva still has one left uh, one fight left on his current UFC contract. Dana White it was already saying that he was lucky to get this fight let alone he's have another one. Um do you think Silva fights anywhere else outside of the UFC if he does he get another promotion anywhere else do you think he continues on or does he just stay as like a coach or well, this, a, that's, a mentor that's kind of the problem is there are other promotions that will seek Anderson Silva out because of his name because of who he is right. and he loves to fight so much that he will get in his own way and that's why Dana White was saying I'm not going to stop him from signing with other promotion. If he wants to move on and continue to fight, fine. I'll release him from his contract. But it's up to his family to really get on him and, and really stop him from fighting again because his body can't do it. He he doesn't have the stamina, the 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 power to do it anymore. He just doesn't. And right. he someone's got to stop him from hurting himself. You know, he 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 suffered devastating injuries in his career and this is he's at a point where if he gets injured like that again it could have severe implications on the longevity of his of his health of his life and this isn't a sport where you fool around no. that you can't take risks like that and his sons have been saying for the last few years dad you need to hang it up you need to stop like I, i'm scared for you and I know he's listening to him, but this time he's really got to listen to him. When they say it's time, he's he's got to stop. There there's no there's no reason you don't have anything else to prove. So yeah. what are you fighting for? I know you're doing it for yourself. I know you could care less about the outside noise, but it's time. And if that no, it is, it is. And and Anderson Silva, you know, he is going to be revered as the guy that we saw years ago. He's not going to be the guy that Uriah Hall beat. That's not who we're going to remember. I think he needs to leave it at that, as as tough as that may be. And you know what? Let him be a coach. Let him be a mentor. Let him be somebody that you, you, uh, you know, you can fight with in, you know, as you train. Uh, let him be somebody, you know, for that purpose. But pro professionally speaking, if fighting in front of crowds, fighting – you know, it, on uh, promotions and for events, I just don't think that, you know, his body can sustain it anymore. I mean, just going back to this fight, you, you saw, we, you know, we're watching it obviously separated. We, you know, we're not together, but we, we were on the call with each other. And, you know, it, we, the, for, through the first three rounds, we're like, okay, I, I don't know if he's either tired or if he's just getting ready for the championship rounds. Like, what is he, what, what's the game plan here? And then as soon as the fourth round started, we he was just gassed. There was no question about it. He was not. Uh, he was just not there. And yeah. I, 
I think that is the the biggest telltale sign that if your body, as much as your mind is in it, if your body can't do it, you have to hang it up. You're going to risk major injury and major consequences to your health if you don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we expected Anderson Silva to start out that fight the way he started out every other fight in his career. He moves around. He doesn't throw a punch. He doesn't throw a kick. He just wants to feel you out. He wants to get a feel for what you're trying to do. And he'll take his time. There's no rush. He has five rounds, so why 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 rush it? And there's no crowd. He doesn't have to be a people pleaser like he like he tries to be. So there he could do what he what he wants when he wants. He can take his time. And he took full advantage of there being no crowd because no no one's there to boo him. So take as much time yeah. as you need. And he literally took four minutes out of the, the first round to just stand there and figure out Uriah Hall. And he landed some good shots. He had some good rounds in the beginning. But yep. he quickly dwindled off and drifted away from the Anderson Silver we're used to because his, he just can't do it anymore. So it, it's unfortunate to see, but like you said, we'll never remember Anderson Silva for what he is today. We'll remember for him, uh, remember him for what he was 10 years ago for yeah. the, the unbelievable title reign he had and, and the destruction he caused in the middleweight division. And for sure. He'll he'll always be a pioneer in this sport. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I would even go as far as to say if you were to create a Mount Rushmore of UFC fighters for the UFC brand, I would have to imagine that Anderson Silva makes his way as one of those four heads etched in stone for this brand. Uh, because there is no UFC the way it is today without somebody like Anderson Silva to build to help build that brand and be uh, an iconic superstar for which you base your uh, pay-per-view events and your ma your major money-making events off of. Yeah, I mean, he was the first John Jones. He was the first Habib. You know, there, there, he was the first person to come into the sport and absolutely dominate the best of the best. Right. So it, it, you don't see these, pl these people, these fighters, all the time. They're once in a blue moon, and when you get to see them, you, you get to – you just sit back and enjoy them because it's not going to last forever – and as much as Anderson Silva wants it to, it, that's just not the case. For sure. Um, all right. I mean, you know, Anderson Silva looking to to retire. Well, as, as we noted last week and as, as we were able to uh, talk about a little bit, uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov did retire. Um, Dana mentioned he doesn't believe that Khabib is officially retired, which is kind of shocking because, you know, when you hear it straight from the horse's mouth, you tend to believe it. Uh, but Dana is under a different impression, and he believes that he will honor, uh, that Habib will honor his father's wishes to retire at 30 and 0. He currently stands at 29 and 0. Uh, Dana made clear the lightweight title is not vacant, and he will not vacate the title uh, until he knows absolutely 100% unequivocally that Habib will not be returning. Um, I, it begs the question, if you're in the lightweight division, what is going through your mind? I mean, what, what should they be expecting? Or even, I guess to say, what should they be fighting for, right? Yeah, I think that what Dana said, it it kind of makes some sense. And, and as much as we want to believe Habib and think that he's going to keep his word, I think at the end of the day, he's going to honor what his, what his father wanted for him to retire 30 and 0. And I, I agree with Dana and we don't know when he's going to fight next. If he's going to fight next, it, it's most likely going to be a while, but I think the, what, where the UFC and where Dana lucks out, is that the lightweight division is kind of up in the air. There's nobody n next in line to fight for the title. The next in line for the title is whoever wins that Poirier-McGregor fight. So once that fight is over is over in January, now we're looking at probably a September-October or, or, or even further in, towards the end of the year having the title fight then. So Khabib has... 14 months or so to figure it out whether he wants to fight or not there's plenty of time i think that 
I don't think there's anybody else that's available. Gaethje's not going to get another shot. Uh, you know, Dan Hooker uh, lost to Poirier, so he he's obviously not in line. Uh, you know, there there's just Tony Ferguson. Yeah, Tony Ferguson lost to to Gaethje, and I mean, well, I don't think Tony Ferguson would get the honor of fighting Khabib in his last fight when we just saw what happened to Justin Gaethje. And we saw what Justin Gaethje did to Tony Ferguson. So, <laughs> right. Uh, as much as we've we've been waiting to see Ferguson and Khabib, it's never going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, if I had to make an idea, um, you know, if 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 I'm Dana, right now these guys are like you said, they're they're getting in position to fight for that title so with this mcgregor poirier fight uh you you know the winner of that would probably be next in line for that title if it's not habib right if if he is truly done i would have to assume that the winner of the mcgregor poirier fight has to fight justin gaethje i think that has to be the next fight that happens because as as much as we want to return the on the assumption that Habib is going to be coming back and he's going to be, uh, you know, f f fulfilling his father's wishes of thirty and zero or you know that dream, the fact remains he promised his mom he wasn't coming back, and there has to be some sort of secondary plan in case that does not happen. Um, and like I said, it, if if Dana White doesn't vacate the title, if he does not allow for the UFC, uh, you know, the, these fighters to to compete for a title, they ha at least have to get into some sort of pecking order in which they should be able to fight for a title, whether it's Habib or it's a, vaca a vacated title, and then, you know, move on from there. I think right now it's just one jumbled mess where, again, you had Tony Ferguson who just lost to... Uh, Justin Gaethje. Gaethje lost to Khabib. McGregor and Poirier are fighting in January. Whatever happens there will be, you know, it would have to be in line for Justin Gaethje. And then Ferguson, I assume, would have to fight Poirier or McGregor, whoever loses that one. And then that would be your one through four after all those fights are considered. Yeah, I would agree that it has to be Gaethje would get if if the title were vacant it would be Gaethje versus whoever wins this Poirier McGregor fight I think that's without a doubt what Dana will end up doing even if Habib says you know I'm not sure even in say September October of 2021 he's still not sure that's where an interim championship comes into play that's when you're gonna you're gonna have somebody for, fight for that and that'll be your clear cut number one contender until the title, the actual title, is available. And as much as I hate ice inter interim championships, this is one instance where it actually makes sense. And I think that with the way Dana is talking, it'll be very difficult for him to strip Khabib of the title at any point. I, I think he's going to try to hold on to the fact that Khabib's father wanted him to fight one more fight and, and it's going to happen. He he firmly believes that and I don't think his mind is going to change in the next year. And it, well, it, I, th I think that there has to be, if you're well, Hab McGregor, Poirier, Gaethje, Ferguson, whoever, you have to have a conversation with Dana and basically say, listen, there needs to be a firm date for him to make that final call because you can't wait for two years before this decision is made. This needs to be made in a year to 14 to 15 months max. I mean, that has to be the time frame in which you are looking for because these guys, this is what they do for a living. And if you're continuously trying to recycle an interim champion because your feeling is that somebody's going to come out of retirement and you want to preserve their right to be champion. I, 
I, I can't imagine that that doesn't have an expiration date that there has to, especially not just for these fighters, but for the viewing audience, for the fans of the sport, we have to be able to understand that there's an actual champion going to be crowned at some point in time. We can't just hold on to the, to the, uh, you know, the glory days of when Habib was fighting it, at that point, just retired the entire division with him because at that point there's nothing to fight for. Another thing to consider is, Khabib, even if he fights again, right? He fights one more fight. Right. He's not going to fight Dustin Poirier. He's not going to want to. He already beat him. So why fight him again? He doesn't well, he's want... beaten almost everybody. He doesn't want to fight McGregor. We all know that. Hey, there's nothing to prove there. And he, he just beat Gaethje. So those those are your top three fighters. So he we all know he wants to fight George St. Pierre. They're... He, he, he's been vocal about right. that. And but G, George Saint GSP no. has said that he doesn't want to fight. And even if right. that fight occurred, it would probably occur either at a catchweight or at, 160, uh, at um, 170. So I don't think that the fight, it, that fight wouldn't be for the title anyway. So why, why not strip him? Maybe what needs to happen is if Dana's not going to strip him, Khabib just rela uh, releases it just like John Jones did. Says... I don't need the title. I don't know if I'm going to fight again. And if I do, it's only going to be against this guy and it's going to be at this weight. So there, there's no reason for me to hold on to this title. I'm not going to defend it again. So why should I have it? Right. Um. Yeah, I just, again, it's one of those situations where, again, Habib has beaten everybody up until this point. And we're at a situation where... The people he hasn't beaten aren't in line to face him. So where do we go from here? And again, I think if he doesn't release it himself, Dana White has to have an idea, uh, you know, basically a, a drop dead date of, okay, if he's not back by this point in time, this we have to release the, the championship and have that packing order ready to go. Because at this point, you know, not for anything as great as these fighters are if they're not fighting for a real championship it's going to hurt the brand it, it is because it's much easier to sell a championship fight than it is to sell you know just 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 names to headline a fight and you know you you know we talk about it all the time if there's not a championship involved they can't be or pro most likely can't be the main event on a pay-per-view and these are names that would headline a pay-per-view for sure I don't see Dana ever stripping the best pound for pound fighter. I, I, I he he loves him too much to to do that. He'd rather everybody fight for an inter interim championship than strip a guy like Habib. That's just, that's how, that's just how, how he, he works. He has to, but he has to. Strip even him. even, even if 12 to, even 12 if it, to fifteen months, even it, even if it was a year and a half, he probably wouldn't strip him. I would I would be surprised if he did. I just think, as a business standpoint, you have to, because then what are what are these guys fighting for? They fight to be the best, and you're not the best until you hold that belt. And that if that belt isn't on the table, again, I beg the question. What are you fighting for? It's that I mean, simple. I, I mean, I, I know it, it, it's tough because on, we all feel just like Justin Gaethje does. An interim championship means absolutely nothing. Throw it on the ground. It, it's yeah. garbage. It's a piece of metal, as uh, some likes to say. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it's... Thank you, Rob Manfred. <laughs> it's, it's a tough situation, and Dana's got to get out of his own way at some point. I don't know if yeah. it's going to happen. I, I don't. I wouldn't expect it. For sure. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of questions. We can speculate all day. Um, but there is one thing that, that happened in this division that we'll be excited about. Uh, it seems like uh, Nate Diaz called out uh, Dan Hooker uh, in a tweet and said, you know, let, let's go. Let's, you know, Hooker accepted. Uh, now the question is, are they going to fight at 155 or are they fighting at 170? Um, and on top of that, what does this look like? What you know? What what are we expecting from this this fight here? Yeah, I, I think that. I mean, this is an interesting fight. I would I would be surprised if this fight took place at, at fifty five. 
I would expect this to be a welterweight bout. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, I think that's a good spot for Dan Hooker. I think that he would be better suited if he moved up a weight class, put on some pounds. He could really do some damage. And I think that that is better competition for him. I don't know if Dan Hooker, he, he's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay his abilities at all. But I don't know if he can stand in there with a guy like Justin Gaethje. I, I mean, he lost to Poirier, and to me, Poirier isn't on Gaethje's level. So what is he going to be able to get past Gaethje at any point? I mean, I, I don't see that happening. I think Dan Hooker would have more success if he, if he moved up to 170. And this is a perfect opponent, Nate Diaz. You know, he, he he wants to fight. He, you know, the, the fight um, was extended to Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker was like, yeah, just give me a weight class and uh, and let's fight. So th this fight's going to happen. We just need the details to get worked out. We need the contracts to get signed. Um, this will be an interesting one. And this will be a good sign. If Dan Hooker is able to do well against Nate Diaz, and I think he could have a good shot in this fight then th this might be an eye-opening experience for him to, to say maybe it's time to, to leave the, the lightweight division and move to welterweight. Yeah, it'll be interesting for sure. Definitely something to keep your eye on. Um, there, you know, there, there's a lot in the UFC that's going on and so things that you got to keep your eyes on as well. Uh, and for, for us, one of the uh, fun things to look forward to is the return of the ultimate fighter set for March of 2021, right? Um, right now w it will include the men's bantamweight and middleweight. Uh, the remote casting will be going on through November 13th. And right now the coaches are TBD. Uh, the coaching, you know, we, we, we have some ideas. Uh, we're going to throw this on, on Twitter. Make sure you check us out on, on, on Twitter and, you know, vote in our poll as well. Um, but let us know who your th your coaching predictions are for this. Uh, right now, you know, uh, Nick, I want to hear from you. Who do you have as a possible coaching uh, for this? You know, I, I remember watching this when it was Cody Garbrandt and um, TJ Dillashaw. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah, I think of that. I, I didn't have one of these guys on my on my list of potential coaches until I saw a a tweet that Joe Rogan said something on his podcast in June of this year. I he, obviously Joe Rogan is best friends with Dana White. Dana White tells him a lot of things. Joe Rogan said on his podcast in June that not only is the Ultimate Fighter returning, but that. Israel Adesanya and Paulo Costa are going to be the coaches, which oh, is surprising. Lord. I would expect a guy like Israel Adesanya. That was number one on my list. I would love to watch that guy. He is he is money every time he talks. Every time you see him, he's money. Paulo Costa is an interesting guy. He's more reserved. He does he can't he's not as quick witted. I don't think there's anybody really as quick witted as Adesanya. Uh, Paulo Costa is doesn't have. I don't think he'll be able to keep up with the the energy that Adesanya brings. That's because he's a bloated Ricky Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that... And, and I don't know who they're going to end up getting, who what kind of fighters they'll bring in, if they're going to be international or uh, if most of them are going to be from North America. But it's going to be tough for a guy like Paulo Costa who... You know, English isn't his second language. It's it's going to be tough TV, and at the end of the day, this is an a, a television series. So English it's got, is his second language. English is 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 the second language. Yes, right. So if if a guy like that is speaking to mostly people that are, you know, that are English speaking, it might be tough for him, which isn't going to be good TV, and that's why I don't think he'd make it such a, a great coach. I think there's better options out there, and. This is my list of who I think could be potential coaches. I have Adesanya, Tony Ferguson, who was in The Ultimate Fighter, Jorge Masvidal, and Aljamain Sterling. I think those are guys that could be great coaches. Uh, and this is perfect for Aljamain because he's fighting in December against Peter Jan for the for the title. Mm. So he'll have plenty of time. This you know they're they're starting up in March. I think that 
any any one of these guys would be able to be uh, they'd be great coaches first of all and i think they'd make for great tv yeah for sure um Paulo Costa, yeah, I definitely raised some eyebrows. I don't think he'd be a very good coach. He doesn't seem like the the person that you know you you could learn a lot from. He just seems like he he does it his way, and you know he he's kind of you know like you said reserved and just you know I, I don't want to say selfish because he's not you know, but it's more it's just you know he doesn't like to be bothered. It, it's his it's his thing. Adesanya wants to talk to anyone and everyone that's around him at all points in, of time um out of your list i would be very interested to see jorge masvidal as as the other coach i think that would be extremely excite uh exciting to see him because he has a mouth of his own on top of that he is very good at coaching and mentoring and uh you know he has a lot to learn from um and and he, I think he'd be an absolute blast, opposite of Israel Adesanya to to have on the same show. I think that'd be a really incredible match. Oh, it definitely would be. I mean, Jorge Masvidal is a sensation. He is, I mean, he he is a headliner by himself, and so is Izzy. And right. if you put those two together, it's absolute dynamite. So it, to to everybody would be tuning in every single week to just hear those guys and, and what they have to say. Cause you know, you're going to get some great takes here and there from these guys. And it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be fantastic. So I, I, I would, that would probably be the ideal coaching setup for, for this. Uh, it'll definitely be interesting though. I don't know if the Adesanya Costa is for sure. That's just something that I've heard from somebody who has connections. And that was in June when we thought, the Ultimate Fighter was coming back this year, and that was coming back next year. So things could have definitely changed. Paulo Costa might not be interested. Adesanya might not be interested. We don't know how everything's going to play out, and this is something that we'll have to touch back on when we when when you know, when we know more. For sure, and like I said, we're gonna we're gonna host a poll on our Twitter. It'll be up for the next week or so. We'll we'll go over the results next week. Uh, but make sure you hit us up at Trash Talk uh, Media. Um, we're on Twitter. Our link is in the description. So if you don't want to try to find us, all you have to do is go into the description, click the link. It'll bring you right to our page. Um, all right. I think that's going to do it for the UFC for, for this episode. We, we had a lot to talk about a lot of great things. Um, again, if, if you've made it to this point in the, uh, in the podcast, we truly appreciate you listening. Um, but we, we want to transition over to the NFL. Uh, just a, a couple quick points, a couple uh, quick hitting topics that we have going on here. Um, Tuesday was the NFL trade deadline. And as we said in the opener, not a lot happens usually on deadline day. Um, there were definitely some notable storylines to watch, whether Will Fuller was going to be traded from the Houston Texans. It looked like the Texans and Packers had some, uh, some sort of mutual interest in getting that deal done. Uh, Bill Belichick had came out and said that Stefan Gilmore was available for a first round pick and a player um, uh, amongst other players. But uh, we're going to go through uh, the, the notable transactions that happened uh, about a week before the deadline leading up until it actually uh, transpired. Uh, the first one uh, we saw the San Francisco 49ers send Quan Alexander to the new Orleans saints for Kiko Alonso and a 2021 fifth round pick. Uh, Nick, what did you think about this trade when you saw this? Yeah, this one doesn't really make any sense to me. Because when I think about Quan Alexander and Kiko Alonso, I think they're pretty much the same. In fact, I think Kiko might be a little bit better because Quan Alexander can't stay healthy. In fact, he's injured now. He's not going to be back for the Saints. So I don't think that you're upgrading that too much from from one guy to another. And, and now you're giving up a fifth-round pick, which could turn out to be a great player. So... I, I don't I don't like this for the Saints. I don't think it makes a ton of sense. You're getting rid of a guy that's been in your system for I believe three years now. So what what are you trying to do here? You're I, you're obviously trying to contend for a Super Bowl. This is probably Drew Brees' last year. What what's the deal here? It this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's interesting for me. 
Uh, Kiko Alonso, obviously starting with the Buffalo Bills, right? And yeah, then the, the Miami Bills. Dolphins. Yep. And then the Saints. And now with the San Francisco 49ers, this man has jumped all over the place. Um, he's almost like the Brandon Cooks uh, on defense. You know, just can't can't figure out uh, to fit, you know what his home is. Uh, but I, I think the Saints they gave up a lot for Quan Alexander. Quan Alexander was really good in Tampa Bay. Showed a lot of promise. Showed a lot of skill. Um, not so much in San Francisco. I think they were looking to get rid of him. They were able to do that. Send him to the Saints. The Saints lose Kiko Alonso, who hadn't done much for them necessarily. But they also gave up a fifth round pick as well. So I I would have to if I had to grade this, I'd give the San Francisco 49ers like a a D. I'd give the Saints a, you know, like a C plus. Yeah, I, I I would probably agree with that. I I this probably benefits the, the Niners more because they're getting a, a guy that's very similar uh in uh, ability wise. They're getting a guy who can stay healthy a lot more, and right. they get a, a fifth round pick out of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it seems like it's a a win a win for them. It's it's definitely a loss in my book for the for the Saints, for sure. Um, then we also saw the you know the the New York Jets, the good old Jets. Gotta love, gotta love the Jets. Um, Avery Williamson, linebacker, traded to the Steelers along with a 2022 seventh round pick for a 2022 fifth round pick. Um, yeah, my thoughts on this are pretty simple. The Jets are in sell mode. They gave away Avery Williamson to a team that just lost De- lost Devin Bush, and they got a fifth round pick for him, gave up a seventh. I, I, I don't really know... I, I I know the Jets are in sell mode, but I think they could have gotten a, a little better of a deal than this. I, I just don't see I you know, Avery Williamson, for as much crap as you can give the Jets for how poor they've played, I think he's a better player than what he's being given credit for. Um, you know, well, when you I don't look- I don't want to put too much stock into Avery Williamson. I definitely don't think he's the guy that we saw in Tennessee. No, he's not that guy for sure. But it it could also be the fact that you know the Jets organization sucks the life out of players as we as we've seen for the last ten well, twenty this, years. This is another one that really I don't understand because we've seen Robert Spillane the last two weeks, and Spillane has been great. He has been fantastic for them. He has he done has. a great job stepping in for Devin Bush. So is he not good enough? Because I don't think. Avery Williamson is. I think it's more of a rotation piece. It's more of a rotation piece. Get him off the field in passing situations because he's slower. He's not a great coverage linebacker. He's more a thumper in the run game. Avery Williamson can cover a little better. He has more sideline to sideline speed. uh, So what you're saying is when Avery Williamson's in the game, run. When Spillane's in the game, pass. Okay. Right, but if it's if it's third down, third and seven, you're not going to run the ball unless you're the Minnesota Vikings or if you have Brian Schottenheimer calling your plays. Other than that, there is no reason that you would run the ball when Avery Williamson is on the on the field. I just I don't think that's never how I've ever seen the Steelers run their defense. They've never had a rotation. It's always well, been the-, the same guys out there. You you've had uh, T.J. Watt. You've had. Uh, Devin Bush and you've had Bud Dupree. Those three guys have anchored the linebacking group, and then and they never get rotated out. So why would you do that now? And I think Spillane, he's only two games in. You got to give the guy a shot. He showed in his first two games that there's something there. There's no better team at drafting linebacker than the Steelers. Well, and I think that's I think that's something that you're gonna that is working against you. You're talking about a team that knows what they're doing at the linebacker position. Just traditionally speaking, from well, the they, 70s they like until speed. now. They like speed, and, and Spillane doesn't offer that. Avery Williamson does. But I think, right. I think you need a guy like Spillane to offset a guy like Bud Dupree and TJ Watt, two pass rushers. 
No, I, I understand that. But Spillane, it, again, is going to be used on, on running downs. He can still cover, not not to, you know, he can cover to an extent, Yeah, as we saw in his interception this past week. But the fact remains is that Avery Williamson is a better coverage linebacker. Spillane is a better run defending linebacker. And they gave themselves depth in case Spillane goes down, in case somebody goes down. They have that depth. And Avery Williamson's contract is up at the end of this year. So they really gave up a whole hell of a lot of nothing to get a depth piece. Because, if again, if they have, uh, if they have Devin Bush, this deal doesn't get done. It's that simple. They're not even looking for this deal. But they they just wanted to make sure that they had a piece in place just in case something crazy happens. Maybe give some rotation, have somebody that can come in on passing downs. That It's that simple. They're just trying to bolster their defense in a way that they knew how. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Devin Bush going to come back at some point this season? He's not done for no. the year. No, he's done for the season. Okay. I thought, I, I thought that he was coming back this season i didn't think he suffered a career or a season ending injury <laughs> not career <laughs> yeah no um devin bush is done for the season um yeah okay he did he tore his acl okay i just i just confirmed that but that's what i thought okay so, so i mean hey the the steelers are looking good this season i thought they would try to bolster their does their secondary try to get a defensive back in there, a corner? That's really what they need. I mean, Joe Hayden's okay, and it kind of drops off from there. But <clears throat> Stefan Gilmore, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> and I, I'm not really sure what their uh, their salary cap looks like. But I mean, I, I they, they obviously they're a little. They they couldn't afford Stefan Gilmore. I know that he's too expensive for most teams. They're a little tight. They, I mean, they've spent a ton of money on defense, but they've also spent a ton of money on that offensive line. I mean, to keep the offensive line that they have intact, they had to spend money. You're talking about Marquise Pouncey. You're talking about Alejandro Villanueva, um, David DeCastro, Marcus Gilbert. Those boys don't come cheap. And to to utilize, to consistently have a top five, top three offensive line protecting Big Ben, creating holes in that running game for James Conner, um, you know, especially in a division where you have a defensive line in Baltimore and Cleveland that can get after the passer pretty quickly. Now, I know some of you Ravens fans are going to get after Nick because he doesn't know what he's talking about, about, you know, the Ravens uh, pass rush with I, four uh, only. Uh, but the fact remains that whether Baltimore can get there, get there with four or five or six doesn't matter. They still put pressure on opposing quarterbacks and they have that ability to do that. And with that, you know, the, the Steelers had to spend some money. Yeah. They had to spend some, some money and that clearly shows with their weak secondary and it, you know, they, they've held up so far. They're obviously seven and oh, they can't be too bad. Well, right, and you're talking about, you know, they did make a trade last year for Minka Fitzpatrick. Uh, Fitzpatrick has been absolutely lights out since arriving in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, basically revitalized his career because he was looking like a bust in Miami. Um, mostly just a, a, a scheme fit issue. Not necessarily he didn't want to be there, just didn't fit. And that's fine. Um, but he has, he looks like an all pro safety uh, that they got for cheap uh, in Miami. Oh, for sure. And I mean, he's not the only one in the last year. We can say Minka Fitzpatrick, DeForest Buckner, and Stefan Diggs, all guys that came at a, a first round draft pick price. But look how they've been doing. They've been balling out for their teams and, and really contributed a lot. But I Absolutely. You know, Avery Williamson, he might fit in here for the Steelers. I think Splane's got something. I think that there that he is going to be a star in this league. He'll he'll definitely be around for a while. I I'll be I'll be curious to see how the Steelers rotate them out and how they utilize them moving forward. Yeah, for sure. It'll be interesting to watch. Um, but you know, the the Steelers, they're they're in a great spot and they're not looking back, they're looking forward. So and they have every right to do so. Um, all right. Let's move on to the next one. Everson Griffin, defensive end from the Cowboys, traded to the Detroit Lions for a conditional 2021 sixth-round pick. Your thoughts on this deal? I mean, when you look at the – before this game, before the, coming into this week, 
the the Lions were second in their division, and I believe they still are. Oh no, they're third in the division. Third, and you're you're going after you're acquiring pieces. I don't understand this. Do you really think that just because there's one additional, possibly two additional playoff spots that you can make a, a push for the playoffs and, and be successful? Because I don't think a lot of... Like, yeah, you have issues on defense, but you have issues on offense too. And I don't think your defensive line is one of them. You have Trey Flowers and Danny Shelton. These guys are, are fine, I, I think. And, and Julian Aquara. I don't think that you need to get a guy like Everson Griffin. How about bolster that offensive line so Matt Stafford's not rushed? Get him another offensive weapon since Galladay's a little bit banged up and you've got some old timers like Marvin Jones. You know, there, there's other How places. about a linebacker like Avery Williamson or, you know, some of these guys that, you know, they struggle at the second at the second level the, of yeah, their defense. Exactly. In the second... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, you've you've had uh, Desmond Trufant not really do anything, and uh, uh, I called I'm, that I'm, one. I'm uh, I'm blanking on the the first round picks name, AJ but the, no, that's no, the Falcons. that's the Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Je Jeff uh, Jeff Okuda. Uh, Jeff Okuda. <laughs> so yeah, Jeff Okuda has been an absolute bust this season, which is very surprising. So I, I'm surprised they didn't try to make a trade for a guy like Stefan Diggs or any really any corner that's on the block. That was that, that was uh the biggest one of the biggest needs for him and ever seen Griffin on this team I don't think he's going to improve them much if at all. Well, they can easily get to the second position in their division. I don't see the Bears as a consistent threat uh, defensively speaking. Sure. Uh, that defense can get uh, them there. I, I that, I'm not. I don't on think their defense. defense can. I don't, that's what I'm saying. I think the defense is great. Uh, they're a top five defense. But they're on the field so much that they can't catch their own breath. Uh, you know, you have uh, a constant struggle between Mitchell Trubisky and Nick Foles. I mean, if you, what did we say all throughout the preseason, the offseason? If you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. That's where the Chicago Bears are at right now. Even with Allen Robinson, even with um, uh, Anthony Miller, um, you know, outside of Javon Wims going off his rocker and punching somebody in the head twice well don't forget about uh, darnell mooney i mean they have receivers they have right players but they also on have no team. running back and they have a, a weak offensive line they need all oh, they're not too far away this is this is this they're not far team, away but it's not this year them and the chargers the bears and the chargers are the two teams that are the biggest disappointments because they have all the pieces there i mean even the the bears have the head coach there they're just a quarterback away the chargers are a head coach away and experience away with justin herbert I, you know these teams need to focus more on their weaknesses and stop trying to bolster your strengths this isn't you know a, a company where you're gonna try to work towards somebody's strengths no you're gonna this is a team where you need your weaknesses to be your strengths you know you need everything to be at the same level Otherwise, it's going to get exploited and you're going to lose. Well, th that's the problem is that, you know, unlike a company, your your weakness is what is, is going to be your Achilles heel because you go literally head to head with another organization who is going to attack your weaknesses. That is what the entire game plan is. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, when when you're bolstering your strength, you're doing a disservice to your team. But I, I don't want to get too far away. We saw Everson Griffin to the Lions. Uh, the Cowboys, they're in sell mode. The injuries to Dak Prescott and Andy Dalton, now Andy Dalton being on the COVID reserve list, uh, has started Ben DiNucci for two games. Looks like he's out in Dallas, thankfully, um, costing me two Cooper weeks. Cooper Rush. Come on. It's Cooper Rush or Garrett Gilbert. I mean, I don't know if they instill on. much Cooper more confidence Rush. in you. That's a name, man. That's a name. That's a player's name. Like, you, who doesn't want to see Cooper Rush? Like, that's exciting. That's a name. You don't want to see Cooper Rush? No shot. I oh, don't care. That sound, he sounds that's like I an traded, exciting player. That's why I traded Amari Cooper in fantasy. Who would you rather Leave see? My team. Cooper Rush or Ben DiNucci? Cooper Rush. I'm going with Depends Cooper Depends on Rush. who you're asking, because TikTok was all in on Ben DiNucci. That is for <laughs> damn sure. Um, 
but for the for the sake of this argument, the the, the Cowboys are in sell mode. That they, they've basically thrown in the towel. They're going to try to get a top pick. Hopefully, work on that defense and and continue moving forward. Uh, obviously, they also released um, Daryl Worley and Don Terry Poe. So they're truly in sell mode. They don't care anymore. Jerry Jones is sitting in his booth fuming because this was supposed to be his year, as was the last twenty years or whatever he keeps saying. Um, Another year for the Cowboys fans to say it's their year. <laughs> um, all right. Two more picks and then, you know, we, we're out of here. Uh, defensive end Carlos Dunlap finally leaving the Cincinnati Bengals for the first time in his career. Traded to the uh, Seattle Seahawks for offensive tackle B.J. Finney, a 2021 seventh round pick. Uh, what did you think of this trade? I love this trade. I think it's a win-win on both sides. I think that very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, <we> <laughs> uh, yeah, Carlos Dun- Dunlap is a am- he he's he's a great player. He is a lot of his talents have been wasted over the years in, in Cincinnati, and now yeah. he gets to go to a Super Bowl contender in, in the Seattle Seahawks. Who and need it, desperately needed pass rush help. Who desperately need pass rush pass rush help for for sure. And then B.J. Finney and a seventh-round pick to the Cincinnati Bengals, who just signed Quentin Spain as well. Well, it turns out that they needed B.J. Finney this past week. And, oh, and guess what? B.J. Finney helped them le- helped them to a win against the Tennessee Titans. So that's a win. If you can get a solid guard in B.J. Finney, that that's solid. You had Jonah Jackson there at left tackle. He's fine. But you need help everywhere else. You you get Quentin Spain, he's good. Put him at one of the guard positions. Now you have BJ Finney, another guard position. Now you you have three out of the five offensive line positions figured out. Now right. now Joe Burrow can cook. He can become Russell Wilson. You know, let Joe cook. I think that's what we need to start saying. Let Joe cook. Let him cook I behind BJ Finney eat anything and Quentin Spain. By Joe Burrow is cooking. <laughs> that you know. Let's be very clear here. Um, but the fact remains, yeah, though, this was a huge W, um, Carlos Dunlap, he's been a really good talent his entire career. He's been one of the better defensive ends. Uh, a lot of people forget about him because he resided in Cincinnati, Ohio for the majority of his, well, all of his career leading up to this point. So I I was happy to see him, uh, get moved. They, the Seahawks, Uh, get the help they need the Bengals get the help they need and you know all is well with the world Um, and then we also saw the New York Giants who made an interesting move they traded uh, outside linebacker slash defensive end slash do it all uh, defensive player Marcus Golden to the Arizona Cardinals for a 2021 sixth round pick um it was a little interesting for me. You know, Marcus Golden was a Cardinal, so he comes back home, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he wanted that. <laughs> He's like, I just <laughs> left you. I mean, he, he left in free agency, and they're like, no, no, you come <laughs> back now. <laughs> you know, what's, um, really, what's really interesting, in hindsight, I feel like Marcus, Marcus Golden could have been the piece that could have led the helped the Giants to beating the Buccaneers. If he's another pass rusher that Tom Brady has to deal with, hey, maybe that's the difference maker. Maybe he's the guy they were missing. Hey. I mean, I I think the guy they were missing was the referee at the end. That's who they were missing. Let's, yeah. You know. The NFL uh, is at its finest right now. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't know what we're talking about, go back and watch the highlights from Monday Night Football. It was actually an extraordinary uh, game to watch. We we had a lot of fun watching it, and uh, it came down to the wire. It came down to the very NFL last referees. play. Uh, yeah, the the very last play. The referees, you know, had to insert themselves, unfortunately, but that's what they tend to do in these types of games. And you know, here we are. Um, all right. Before we head out, I just want to take a look at a couple of the Week 9 matchups that stood out to us. Uh, We're just going to give our quick thoughts and uh, predictions for these games, and then we'll be out of here, out of your hair, and you can continue on with your day. Um, All right, so the first game that I wanted to talk about was the Ravens at the Indianapolis Colts. This is a 1 o'clock game on Sunday. Um, 
Nick, what are your thoughts for this game? What do you expect to see? And what do you think Lamar Jackson or uh, Phillip Rivers will be able to do? This is a great, great uh, matchup. You've got two stalwarts at uh, on defense just going toe-to-toe and going to make these offenses struggle all game long. I expect this mm-hmm. to be very low scoring. I expect it to come down to the wire. I... I expect the Colts to come out on top and I'm not a Ravens hater. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm a Lamar Jackson hater. Really? I don't believe in him. I don't think he can get it done in crunch time. We saw it against Pittsburgh. He had the drive. He had the last drive to do it and, and he didn't. So I, th- <laughs> I think, <laughs> shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, t- it, it, it bothers me to watch Lamar Jackson throw a football because he, he can't. I could throw a better football than him. I, oh. I, <laughs> I think that as bad as Phillip Rivers is, he can get the job done. He can get the job done with guys named Zach Pascal, Jordan Wilkins, Naeem Hines. I mean, we're going to see some somersaults in the next game for sure. I, I think that it's not going – I don't think it'll be pretty – but it's going to be if you're if you're a true football fan, you're gonna like this game because it's going to be very very tough, very defensive heavy. It's going it's going to be um, a good a, a good matchup for for each other. But again, I still think the Colts are gonna come out on top. I I can't trust Lamar Jackson. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the the Colts are are tough. Uh, their defense is going to swarm Lamar Jackson, uh, kind of like the Steelers did. I think the Steelers gave a really good uh, impression of what can happen. And the Colts defense is much more athletic, much faster, much longer. Uh, they can defend I actually, really well. I, I think they're better against the run. The, they the are Colts better are. against the run. Um, so it's going to be interesting. Again, no Mark Ingram uh, this week. So it's going to be up to J.K. Dobbins uh, and the Gus Bus, Gus Edwards, uh, with Lamar Jackson. It'll be interesting. Um, Philip Rivers is my X factor in this game because Philip Rivers, he can be great or he can just be a dud. I don't exactly know which one you're going to get week to week. Um, so if the Colts struggle and, the, and this ends up being a, a Ravens blowout, it's simply because of the fact that Phillip Rivers did not show up for this game. Um, I hope that's not the case. I expect a great game. I expect, like you said, a very low scoring game, something that we can look forward to there. Um but overall, this is going to be a battle test of – I think it's going to come down to the trenches. The Ravens D-line versus the Colts O-line and the uh, Colts D-line versus the Ravens O-line. Which one is going to get the push, and that will decide the uh, the outcome. Um, all right. The Chicago Bears at the Tennessee Titans. This is an interesting game because these are – two big question mark teams we thought we had each team figured out we thought that uh for the bears nick Foles was going to be the answer because mitchell trubisky got benched and you know even though they they were uh two and oh at the time mitchell trubisky just wasn't wasn't doing well nick Foles hasn't been much better even though they're paying him a buttload more uh money and then on the other side of the coin, you have the Tennessee Titans who are on a two-game losing streak, losing to the Cincinnati Bengals last Sunday, which was a major shocker around the league. To, I mean, to the point where people are just sitting there scratching their heads saying, what the hell is going on with the Tennessee Titans? Um, so uh, my, my initial thought is that the Chicago Bears defense is going to be uh, – They're going to swarm Ryan Tannehill because he doesn't have great pocket awareness. He doesn't have uh, the ability to to escape the pocket properly. Um, And I think that's going to be a big struggle. Their their number one priority, obviously, is going to be stop Derrick Henry. And then they're going to just continuously pass rush, pass rush, pass rush. I think they're going to leave a lot of uh, one-on-one matchups on the outside. Corey Davis and A.J. Brown are going to have to win their, one, uh, their one-on-one matchups, maybe one or two safeties off on you know every so often, but 
they're they're going to bring the house chicago is so it'll be very interesting to see on the other side of the coin i think chicago's offense is just atrocious uh if tennessee can stop allen robinson this game is all but over uh because david montgomery doesn't know how to run a football and that offensive line is suspect at best so outside of those guys and possibly even just jimmy graham uh i I don't know what the bears can do on offense to score points so I'm going to make a bold prediction here. Oh, I'm going to so. I'm going to say that Nick Foles gets pulled partway through the game and Mitchell Trubisky, Mitchell Trubisky leads him for the W. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Trubisky is making his return this week. I think that he is going to take the job back from Nick Foles and I think that the the Bears are the better team. I think Tennessee has struggled too much this season. Where is Jadavion Clowney? Where is Vic Beasley? What have they done? Absolutely nothing. I think I'll they... tell you what they've done. <laughs> they were signed for twenty four and a half million dollars total. They have zero sacks and sixteen total tackles. That's what they've done. Hmm. So a little less than a million dollars, or a little bit more than a million dollars to tackle. I like it. I like it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like that math <laughs> as as a player. Uh, this Tennessee defense is not what it was last year. I don't know what Mike Rabel has done. If he's if COVID just got the best of him this year, but well, is it the loss of Logan Ryan? Is he that special to that defense? I mean, they they, they, well, they, they did up. just trade for Desmond King. We can't forget that. So Desmond King might help them, but he's Dev, Desmond King was never like a, a difference maker. He wasn't even like that. He wasn't a DB necessarily. Like he he helped in like you know in certain situations when they had four corners on the field. But other than that, I mean, he's a special teams ace. Like he's not a guy that you are you should be relying on in your defensive backfield for help, especially when you have Malcolm uh, – uh, oh, my God. Uh, what's Malcolm's last name? Butler. Butler, thank you. <laughs> uh, Malcolm Butler, Kevin Byard, and uh, who's the other safety they got over there? They have Kevin Byard. Yep. And um, I'm blanking on the second one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, it's just I mean, Kevin Byard. <laughs> either way, the, the Tennessee Titans – Defensive backfield was supposed to be a strength, and right now, you know, Adoree Jackson not he, doing anything. Well, he just and, came back from injury, so I think, right. and he did a pretty good job against Tyler Boyd last week. So, you know, I think he'll get better as he gets more into uh, football, possibly. But again, it. he's another guy where he shouldn't be relied upon as your CB one or CB two. I mean that's a, that was what well Logan he's a sneak. Adoree Jackson is a straight uh, slot. He's a nickel corner, and I think Desmond King is going to play opposite Malcolm Butler or opposite Jonathan Joseph. I don't know exactly what's going on with their secondary right now and what Mike Rabel's trying to do with this new acquisition. Uh, it's going to be interesting, but again, Desmond King is not a difference maker. Malcolm Butler is not performing well. Jonathan Joseph is a shell of himself. Adoree Jackson is just coming back. I think that the Chicago receivers should have an easy time. Darnell Mooney has t- uh, speed to take the top off the defense. Allen Robinson is going to be a tough matchup for whatever outside corner wants to match up against him. He's going to get a ton of targets in this game. And I think that uh, I mean, you, you have Jimmy Graham, who is has the most targets in the uh in the red zone i think that he he could play a factor and i i'm still holding out i think david montgomery has the uh ability to to break one of these runs off i think that he's going to do it at some point so uh this is an interesting timing uh that we're talking about this game this was not pre-planned um i just got a notification the titans will be releasing Vic Beasley on Wednesday uh, from his contract. On top of <laughs> that, nice. they, on top of that, they have also released veteran cornerback Jonathan Joseph and okay. veteran long snapper Bo Brinkley. Very interesting moves, and the Vic Beasley one makes sense. I mean, we I don't know if you remember, but before the season or right before the season started, he was showing up to practice late. He wasn't participating, like he wasn't giving a hundred percent. And so it seemed like right from the get-go, it wasn't going to work out. I was surprised that 
he was on the team this long, and I don't really know where Vic Beasley goes, but that's a talk for another time. Now we know where Desmond King fits in. He becomes the clear cut number two, and he'll he'll play um, he'll play either on Allen Robinson some plays or or it'll be Malcolm Butler the entire time. We'll we'll have to uh, yet to see. And now I guess there's more of a clear role for Jadavion Clowney. Maybe he plays more defensive end now that Vic Beasley's gone and doesn't just stand up the entire time. It's going to be interesting. The Tennessee Titans making some moves um, outside of the trade deadline. There, there was a whole hell of a lot to uh, to break down there. But overall, like I said, the, the Titans are in a predicament. They cannot lose a third straight game, especially to the, the struggling Chicago Bears. That if this if they end up losing this game, uh, they're going to be in a very very precarious predicament in which uh, you know they they might be overtaken in their division. Um, and no one, I mean, the Colts are, are there. You, it, the Houston Texans aren't out of it. Um, you know, they, they have competition, and the Tennessee Titans don't look like the team that they had last year. It, it should also come to mind the the loss of Taylor Luan has kind of sparked this this issue. They lost Taylor Luan and then lost the, the following two games. So I have to imagine that has taken a severe hit to the morale and possibly play of this Tennessee Titans football team. I mean, I, I'm not t- completely sold on that just yet. I want to see more time. I think the loss of Taylor Lewan imp- will impact Ryan Tannehill more. And I, st- I haven't seen a drop-off from Tannehill yet. I think with uh, Corey Davis coming back and uh, A.J. Brown there now, I think that this team is going to start getting going. Uh, well, he's... they also lost Adam Humphreys for at least next game, for for this game, I mean, possibly he's your, longer. He's your number three anyway. I don't think he got that many targets. Probably those targets are going to go to Jonu Smith anyway uh, or, or, or just get split between the receivers they have. I don't think that and, that's a big loss, and I don't think I know. That's I be... know we keep adding on to this conversation, but it should be noted: Jonu Smith has, uh, when he hasn't been targeted in the passing game more than four times, they've lost that football game. So I, I think they need to get him more involved in the passing game. You I know, think, I think they could do that next week after I don't play <laughs> Jonu Smith in fantasy football. Um, but you know. I think the Chicago Bears have the edge in this game. There's a lot going on with the Tennessee Titans right now. We we just listed it all, and it just continues to pile on. There's so much going on that isn't related to the game itself. It's a right. lot for these players and for the coaches to handle. And when plus you all have... the time that they spent with the COVID stuff, and yeah, you know that they've been through hell and back this season. Uh, you know it, it's. Uh, you know, we we know it's been a weird year. Twenty twenty has not been the year that we over, all expected. You know, well, is it? You know, it feels like it's been going for three years. Um, but n- needless to say, we're we're in a specific situation where the Titans are. I don't want to call it a must win, but it's it's getting to the point where it's almost a must win situation. Um. All right, we got two more games to discuss on the docket before we get the hell out of here. Uh, the Seahawks at the Bills. This is going to be an interesting game. Seahawks, um, you know, they've had some rocky road. They lost Chris Carson. He didn't play last week. DJ Dallas took over because uh, Travis Homer stayed as the pass catching back. And Carlos Hyde is also uh, injured, hampered by a hamstring injury. On top of that, they should be getting Rashad Penny back in the next couple of weeks. Don't know what he's going to look like coming off the the physically unable to perform list, the pup list. Um, so we'll see what that Seahawks. But um, yeah, I mean, when you have Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf, it it just seems like uh, you know Megatron 2.0 is just it's going unfair. To feast. It's unfair. It really is. But that is my game within the game to watch. DK Metcalf and Tredavious White going head to head is going to be an extremely tall task for both players. Um, DK Metcalf, for you know, we saw what he was able to do against Stefan Gilmore in the Patriots game. He, you know, he he was able to take the top off the defense. His blazing speed kills defenses, and then his absolute mammoth strength to outbody any 50 50 ball should be like, you know, you can't take that away from him. He's got to be double, double covered at all times. 
Yeah, and Tredavious White, he's been struggling with injury this year. I don't think that he is going to be able to handle DK by himself. That's not a guy, as good as Tredavious White is, I don't think you can leave him on an island with DK Metcalf all game. I'd actually probably rather have DK against, I mean, uh, excuse me, I'd rather have Tredavious White matched up against Tyler Lockett the entire game. That's a matchup he can handle by himself. Then you can go and double up DK the, the rest of the game. Hopefully Jamal Adams is coming back this week. We don't actually know yet, uh, but that would be a huge plus for them. Uh, to stop this run game, I mean, you need us. Jamal Adams will help to stop Josh Allen from uh, getting out of the pocket. He'll stop uh, Zach Moss and Devin Singletary, who looked great last week. I think that the Seahawks should have an easy time. I don't see this being a uh, a good game, really. But the bill because the Bills have have been. Uh, They've been getting weaker and weaker every single week, and the fact that they made the Patriots look like a decent team last week is really scary. That means yeah. the, the Bills are not who we made them out to be. They started out hot, and then they just dropped off. And It'll be, and I'll, I'll be, you know, I, I will say this. I'll get just a little caveat to what you just said. Divisional divisional matchups play different so no matter what you see in a divisional matchup it usually plays out very different from uh the rest of the schedule just for the simple fact that you know when you get a play you know the team like the patriots and the bills together bill belichick has seen sean mcdermott sixth or i guess this would be his fifth time now um yeah, so he understands what Sean McDermott's trying to do. There, there's no secrets between these teams. It's just whoever's whoever makes their plays is going to win. That you know, it's that simple. Um, but the the Seahawks and Sean, you know, they haven't faced off against Sean McDermott. They don't understand necessarily. You know, it, it's it's not always black and white when you're watching the uh the film from the previous weeks what they're trying to do so it'll be interesting to see how everything changes um i i think this game is gonna really come down to the arm uh of uh josh allen is he accurate can he no. hit those targets well that's no. the thing can he hit those targets when it counts the most no he's um, been regressing every single week like he has not looked. He good. started out very and high. He did. And has come down. The last month, he looked like the Josh, the Josh Allen of old. He he's not the same guy that we we thought that he made a great improvement from year two to year three, and now he we're just seeing a bunch of year two, Josh Allen right now. And right. I think that's now we're gonna have to settle on the fact that this is who Josh Allen is. This is his ceiling. I don't. I think he has peaked. I don't think he's going to, at least in this regime, with who he has at coach, I don't think he's going to improve anymore. He is, he's limiting himself. He, he's clearly not learning from his mistakes. He's, he's not making any well, improvements I I, to his game or how he, how he handles himself on the field. I don't think Brian Dayball was ever, uh, you know, pegged as somebody who was like a QB whisperer. He was never somebody that was going to come in right, and mold Josh Allen. How he hard has it be for a guy like Josh Allen, who has all of these weapons around him, uh, uh, to to not perform better. He has a fantastic defense. He has great receivers. Uh, you know the tight end situation has been a little bit iffy this season, but and then he has two running backs behind him. I I I think he should be able to do more. He's too athletic and too gifted to be where he is right now. Well, and that's the thing. I think he relies a lot on his athleticism and his, his gifts to be able to play the game rather than his ability. He, you know, he hasn't worked on the mechanics. He hasn't worked on his precision passing. He's focused on, you know, okay, you know, my speed to get out of the pocket. I got to work on, you know, eluding tacklers and learning how to best protect my body outside the pocket and all the other things that, say, a Peyton Manning or a Brett Favre or even a Tom Brady never really had to worry about. Yeah, I mean, this is not going to be a good game for Josh Allen. This is not going to be a good game for the Buffalo Bills in general. This is going to be another big... This is going to be similar to what we saw the Seahawks do against the Niners. It's going to be a blowout. It's not going to be close. I, I, I don't expect anything big from the Buffalo Bills. I, I just don't think they have what it takes to to compete against a guy like Russell Wilson or DK Metcalf. 
it, it, it's the the cards are not in their favor in this one for sure um all right we have one more game to get to uh for me the personal highlight of the entire weekend this will be the new orleans saints visiting the tampa bay buccaneers uh this is the second matchup of the season the first one happened in excuse me week one uh where the saints were able to take down the buccaneers 34 to 23 um in that game you know michael thomas you know played a little bit and um, you know, it, the, the Saints have been all over the place since then. So it's been really tough. They haven't had a whole hell of a lot to uh, work off of. It's been the Alvin Kamara show, maybe some uh, Jared Cook sprinkled in, but hopefully they can get um, Emmanuel Sanders back off the reserve COVID list. They're looking at possibly uh, getting Traquan Swift, Smith more involved, but Outside of the New Orleans Saints, I want to mainly discuss the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Buccaneers struggled against the New York Jets. Uh, sorry, the New York Giants. Nobody struggles with the Jets. Um, the New York Giants gave Tom Brady a, d- a dose of reality when they were able to gain pressure on him up the middle. And I mean, it is no secret that Tom Brady struggles when they – bring when any team brings pressure up the middle he does not like pressure at his feet and i think that needs to be noted moving forward in the season now not every roster is going to have a leonard williams and you know the the guys that are going to be able to rush the pass dexter lawrence and such to to get there with just their defensive line however the tampa bay buccaneers also add antonio brown coming in this season uh, now he will be added for the week nine roster. Bruce Arian said they're going to look to get him the ball about 10 times. And then if that pack, that particular package works, maybe it goes up to 30 times, but it won't be, you know, the, the whole game, but we're going to see a lot of Antonio Brown, whether he's on the field getting targets or if he's a decoy, what we don't exactly know what what's in store. Regardless, Antonio Brown added to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense already riddled with Leonard Fournette and Ronald Jones and Rob Gronkowski and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin when he comes back and Jaden Mickens who made a a splash uh, on Monday Night Football. You know, this Buccaneers, the the rich just keep getting richer. Yeah, this is going to be a different game than week one. You can't look at it in the same light. Week one. The Buccaneers were a brand new team. They had a ton of new players. They, including Brady, like he was one of them. Well, yeah, Brady. I mean, the the guy who leads the offense didn't really know the system fully, and and now he has um uh, he's he's much more um involved in that offense. He he knows the playbook very well now, and you're you're gaining a guy who was once considered the best wide receiver in the league in Antonio Brown and a guy who I don't know if you still want I, I follow this guy on a lot of a lot of social medias I've seen him on football fields over the last few months and he hasn't lost a beat he looks like the same Antonio Brown I expect him with the way he works I expect him to be at full at his full strength by the end of this game I think that this is a guy who you can't take away his ability to run routes and catch balls and, and create separation. He he is exactly what Tom Brady needs. Tom Brady doesn't need the fastest or the biggest. He needs somebody who can create separation. That's why he loved Julian Edelman so much was because he was able to create separation and he could throw him uh, throw him the ball really quickly. And that's why we, we, we saw that a little bit in that one game he had with New England last season. He had he got I believe five or six catches on seven or eight targets, and I expect and a touchdown. And, and you're gonna see that and, and a touchdown. You're gonna see that exact same thing this week. He's gonna be utilized in the same aspect. They're living together, so I think that means they they're probably just talking about football constantly and getting Antonio Brown incorporated and talking about hey, which plays do you like? Which routes do you like to run? What do you you know? They're they're talking about all these things and they. They tr- they have a real friendship that that is going to show up on the football field. So that's something that is much bigger than what we've seen, especially in that week one game. 
You might get it should, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. It should also be noted that Antonio Brown is very familiar with the system. Bruce Arians, the head coach and offensive play caller or, uh, you know, scheme developer for the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, was the offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers when Antonio Brown was highlighting Pro Bowl seasons uh, it, on, with Ben Roethlisberger at quarterback. Now he upgrades to Tom Brady. He's got one of the those o- great offensive lines again. He's back in Arian's system. He, I think he's going to shine. He knows his role. He knows that the scheme fits, and he understands exactly what the you know this uh passing attack is trying to do uh you know maybe just a couple different verbiage here and there but the the overall goal is you know he understands exactly what he bruce arians and company are trying to get done yeah and and real quickly chris godwin might be back i don't i wouldn't say i wouldn't count on it for this game because of the the finger surgery and i don't know how much you can really trust him in this game gronkowski over the last three weeks has turned into the Gronkowski of old. He has, I mean, you, and which makes sense. You would think it would take five weeks or so for a guy who didn't play for an entire year to get back into football shape. It makes sense. So now you have Gronkowski uh, looking like the old Gronkowski. They didn't see that in week one. Mike Evans and, and uh, Tom Brady have more of a connection. Now you have, uh, the offensive line's working better. The defense. Let's talk about the secondary. I mean, the secondary was nothing in week one, and look at where they are now. This is a top three defense in, in the league, and it's thanks to Sean Murphy, Bunting, Carlton Davis, and Jamel Dean. These, these guys have been balling out for them. Antoine Winfield has been doing great as well as a rookie. I mean, the, the everything for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is coming together, and they're not even complete yet. This is a scary team. And it shouldn't be a problem for the the Saints. Now, I mean, you know, uh, if we want to talk about the for Saints the, for real the Buccaneers, quick, Buccaneers, you mean? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be tough for the, for the Buccaneers. If we want to talk about the Saints real quick, like we like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, they traded away Kiko Alonso and they're getting Quan Alexander, who probably won't be playing this game because he's injured. And we don't know if Michael Thomas is coming back. I mean, he suffered a pretty bad hamstring injury, and they're not going to try to rush him back. If you don't have, if if you're getting the New Orleans Saints that we've seen over the last few weeks, it's going to be an easy matchup against the Tom Brady and, and the Buccaneers. Yeah, I and, agree. And and you can attest to this as well as watching Tom Brady over the years as a Patriots fan. You know that Tom Brady plays his best games against the best quarterbacks. You know sometimes he'll struggle against some weaker yeah. opponents. Yeah, and and that's where because he can get complacent. But this is where he brings his A game, and I'll expect it. Right there, you know I haven't I haven't lost I haven't <laughs> lost them. Um, no, you're right. He he elevates his game to to match the intensity of the game that he's playing, um, which which has hurt him in in certain specific times. Uh, you know when he felt like he was playing a lesser opponent, he he didn't necessarily always show out uh, the way he was supposed to. Nonetheless, uh, against a top tier opponent in his division, he's going to. Uh, try to make a statement he's trying he's trying to show out and show up and make sure that everybody understands that this Buccaneers team is for real because if they have another showing like they just had on Monday Night Football and the Saints are able to gobble them up and just absolutely obliterate them we have a lot to talk about next week because the Buccaneers are they have sold out for this year. Uh, you know, they are in a position where half their roster has gone next year with the salary cap declining be anywhere between 20 to $25 million or more. Um, it looks like half of this roster is going to be gutted uh, just because they simply won't be able to afford them under the salary cap. This is their year. If they, if they, you know, they have to show up and show out and they, you know, Brady is on record pace. He's on a, on his pace to hit 50 touchdowns again. Um, and arguably, he might be playing his best football ever. He might be playing some of the best football we've ever seen Tom Brady play. And that has, I mean, it does have a lot to do with the weapons around him. Don't get me wrong, uh, you know, but I don't want to take anything away from Brady himself that this is exactly why Tampa Bay brought him in, knowing full well what they had to surround him with. This is the player they were hoping they're getting, and they cashed in big. Yeah, I mean, Tom Brady, is, it, he, he's a great player, even at 44 years old or 43. Can't remember how old the Sandman is. Um, but, 
you know, father, he, time. <laughs> father time. He's 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 still Tom Brady, and unlike uh, unlike the UFC or MMA in general, where you know your your body can can really hurt you, you know he he's not a mobile quarterback. He sits in the pocket. He it's up to his his arm and his mind to figure out where to put the ball, and it's still working perfectly fine, and he he's still gonna produce, and he has better weapons than he ever did. At, this is the best team he's ever played for in his career. Yes, it's better than the 07 Patriots. <laughs> and, and we're going to we're going to see at the end of the year why why the Buccaneers sold out for this season. It's going to pay off. There's th- Yeah. I mean, again, my prediction is that they're the first team in NFL history to host the Super Bowl that they play in. And they're going to win it. <laughs> they're going <laughs> to win it. I, I I believe they do. I th- I don't think a lot of people question whether they will or not. But, um, you know that that remains to be seen. At, at this point in time, you know we'll 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 track it as as it continues to happen. But uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen, taking the time to uh, you know basically uh, you know talk this out with us and uh, you know everything. Um, Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we got a lot of great support over the last week. We can't thank you guys so enough. We want to continue on this trend. We want to continue upwards. Please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, like the videos. Comment. Let us know what you think about anything we had to say. Uh, as we have started to do over the last few weeks, we're going to break these up into segments. So if you wanted to watch the segment portions, uh, feel free to do that as well. Uh, we love doing this for you guys. And uh, – uh, if you know, make sure to reach us out on, on social media. But uh, over sixty percent of you are still not subscribed. Please, please, please subscribe to the channel. Help us grow. Help us do this for you guys. We want to continue to do this. We want to make this more of a full time job for us, and we would love to be able to do that for you. Uh, with that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your week. Uh, by the time that this video airs, we will know. We should know who has won the president. Uh, the seat of the president of the United States. Um, so make sure to uh, that you went out and vote um, and uh, just make sure you find somebody, tell them you love them and uh, we'll catch you next week.